Hey everyone, welcome to another Watch It Play Q&A show. I'm Matthew and together with a lot of your help, we're going to answer all of the internet's burning board game questions. And the first question I have this month, March. When will the summer come? Which board game components would you be willing to sacrifice in order to bring down the cost of board games? This answer is going to be very, very subjective. So please let me know your answers below. The first thing I'm sacrificing is not a rule book, which we spoke about last month. Inserts for board games. Get rid of them. Get them gone. They're mostly bad. Let's be honest about it. Most inserts aren't good, you know? And most inserts that people say this is a bad insert, really those inserts aren't meant to be good inserts. They're meant to be thrown away anyway. I think about the Fantasy Flight insert, the kind of like cardboard in the trough, the cardboard little thing. They're for throwing away. It's a shipping insert so that all the contents of the game doesn't go wildly around the box during transit. It's not meant to be kept. There's a lot of these plastic inserts that come in games that do technically they do fit all the components in them. If you'd never move the game, <laughs> you know? And the cards kind of like fit in, but just, just the top. So every time you open the game, there's gonna be cards everywhere, pieces everywhere. I could do without those. And I know that the manufacturing of those inserts is a big added cost onto games. Get rid of them. Is getting rid of inserts gonna bring the cost of all games down by five dollars no probably not but could help it could help i would say though just include baggies loads of little bags in games that's what i like i especially like it when a game has more bags than needed so i can use those bags in other games the other components that i would consider getting rid of and i think it does depend on the game and again i would say this is a version of the game that didn't have them that was cheaper because i certainly know that lots of people get a lot of joy and tactile pleasure from resources different resources for different things that's something i don't need is it aura and labora or glass road perhaps that uh, it's a um, uve rosenberg game that instead of resources it has a track i would see that happen in more games where instead of resources you have a little track and maybe you have one resource instead of 600 and you, you move the resource on the track to tell you how many of that resource you have. I think that could be a cost effective thing in games. I don't know the different prices of producing the different boards and then we would want all those boards to be double layered so that you didn't knock them. But yeah, I think there are some games that could have been cheaper and way a lot less <laughs> if they didn't have hundreds and hundreds of resources in them instead had four of each of each source of resource in the game, one for each player, for instance, and then you move that resource along a track to denote how much of it you have. I would, I would be into that, I think. Also, if it's cheaper to get the game in a smaller box, put the game in a smaller box. Please, surely shipping has got to be cheaper. Smaller boxes. It's all I want, <laughs> smaller boxes. What thing would you sacrifice in a game in order to get that price of that game down? Let me know below. Maybe together we can come up with a game that just has nothing inside the box and it's free. <laughs> The next question I found very interesting, and this is why I wanted to answer this one, is what are the best games with an IP, an intellectual property? What's the best game that's got a franchise, movies, books, that kind of thing based around them, comics, that type of stuff? The reason this was an incredibly difficult list for me to write is because there are hundreds of games with massive franchises plastered all over them, some of which are fantastic. So I am told. But I'm just not really a big fan of almost any of the big IPs that there's classically lots of games about. And I think that my list might be interesting to some people because, and your lists, if you can pop them down below, I think my list might be interesting because I do miss out quite a lot of the obvious games. I will say one game that I absolutely love is Comic Hunters. It's a Brazilian game. I hunted down a copy myself. It was more expensive than I wanted it to be. It's absolutely fantastic. One of my favorite games, but I haven't added it in because while it's Marvel themed kind of, the game's about comic book collectors who are hunting down Marvel comics. So it doesn't feel like a Marvel game. It feels like a game about people who like Marvel comics. That makes sense. It's one step away from being an IP game in my mind. But 
it is a fantastic game. We're going to quickly go through this list and it really was difficult to do. The first one, I'm looking at it over there, is by Modifius. And this isn't in any order. There's just 10 games that I really like. And it's called Spectre. I was not expecting to love Spectre. I've got no love of the James Bond uh, franchise. It's fine. I, I you know, it's, it is what it is. It's not my favorite thing in the world. But Spectre was such a good game that I really, really took me by surprise. It's all about trying to have influence in different zones so that you can get your mission done, essentially. You are all the bad guys trying to get the resources you need to upgrade your your bad guy. You do this by the seven different areas of the board, these different layers and stuff around the world, and you're trying to get into those areas uh, so that you get resources and then you can activate the special powers of those areas. It's a really fantastic Euro game that I really thought was a lot of fun. I really liked Spectre. The next two are both pandemic games. Both of them really, really took me by surprise because one is The Clone Wars, which is Star Wars themed pandemic to a greater extent and the other one is wrath of the lich king which is warhammer themed these are two new versions of pandemic they're different enough to each other to justify owning both i feel like but they really utilize the ip that they're from and they do it in such a great way think pandemic but in the in wrath of the lich king you're trying to get all the resources you need to go through these dungeons and then fight the the lich king in the end it wants you to use cards as much as possible it's it's great and you're doing spells like chain lightning and killing everything it's fantastic and then the other one is the clone wars which is fantastic and you're trying to not only do the missions that you need to do but also run away or attack the sith lord kind of person who's chasing you around the board so there's different characters you are, you obviously all play as different characters as well that uh, and these different characters on these enemies you've also got to quell what they're doing whilst also trying to do your missions both of them are just fantastic the next one is an ip that i have really enjoyed and that's the dragon prince Battle Charge. It's essentially a skirmish game where you are fighting your opponent and it's a game where you're using your cards to do attacks in the best way possible and it's also cool because of how you're, because you you control multiple uh, people and your opponent controls multiple people and it's cool because of how the different characters that you control can combo off each other as well as you attack. I found myself really charmed by this one. I thought it was absolutely great and the Dragon Prince Battle Charge, I really think a lot more people would enjoy playing. I think that's one that's gone under the radar. The next one is a bit of an older one and I aware, I'm aware that this technically doesn't count, but it's Dark Moon. Now, Dark Moon is not an IP. I know that. However, Dark Moon is based on something that was called Battlestar Galactica the Dice Game, which was this unofficial version of Battlestar Galactica, which of course is a big IP game. Dark Moon is this dice version type thing of this game where you there's a traitor and you've got to do all these missions when you roll your dice behind a board and maybe you've got good dice, but you want things to go terrible. So you tell people you've got bad dice and then they find out you've got good dice. Oh, it's brilliant. So I'm counting Dark Moon because it's kind of Battlestar Galactica. The next one is Beowulf the Movie, the board game by Reiner Knizia. Now that's a fun one to talk about because essentially it's actually a reprint of an older game called Kingdoms by Reiner Knizia, which is a really good game where you're putting these tiles on a board, trying to do combos with those tiles, score points. And you've got different units essentially that you're using to do that. But it's a tile placement game that's a lot of fun. The reason I like Beowulf the movie the board game other than to say it is because actually it it expands on the original game kingdoms with different boards there's three different boards that you play you play on all three boards during the course of the game and that actually adds some interest to the game and I think it's a really good one that you can pick up for about five to ten dollars which I highly recommend you do next we have the Lord of the Rings the confrontation the Lord of the Rings the confrontation is essentially another Reiner Knizia Stratego style game where you one player plays the goodies the other one plays the baddies in the Lord of the Rings journey and you're trying to uh, get to the other side essentially of the board but there's lots of different all the characters are different powers and they can all do different things and it's such a great battle of wits of a game 
because you can't see what your your opponent's units are so you want to try to work out it's a small board and you want to work out how to get across to the other side essentially and get rid of your opponent's pieces in the best way possible all while there's different win and lose conditions for each player and certain different rules with the train on the board itself it's one that's super quick easy fun and super exciting to play as you're trying to sneak frodo through and hoping nobody goes to attack him when really and you're trying to bait the your opponent into thinking that oh this isn't frodo this is like some really good fighter instead it's like legolas or something i guess and you know so it's a lot of bluffing and strategy and just fun stand-up moments and i really like uh, Lord of the Rings The Confrontation is fantastic. There's two versions. There's an older, smaller box version, and there's a bigger uh, version, which also has an expansion in it, which is a whole second group of units which you can switch out for. If you can hunt any, either of those down, then I highly recommend that you do. The next one is the DC deck building game, and this is a great deck building game that I don't think gets enough love from people that I have really enjoyed. DC Deck Build is all about thwarting the villain's schemes by getting a bunch of cards together and getting more powerful and building your deck up and comboing off. I think it's a lot of fun. It's fast. It's family friendly. I play it with my friend Sean and his family. I've had lots of good times playing it and I think it's a good one. But I also think that Legendary X-Files is a good one. Now Legendary X-Files is a the Legendary series. This is the Legendary Encounters series. It's actually a step up in complexity to the DC game and Legendary is a great deck builder in its own right but the X-Files one is so thematic. It really sows the seeds of distrust as you're playing it. It manages to do things that really feel that if you are a fan of X-Files, that you will, which I am a massive fan of X-Files, that you will enjoy this game because not only do the cards do things and you go, of course that card does that. That makes so much sense. And you've got these, you've got things to get through, missions to achieve and all that, and misinformation being sown left, right and centre. Uh, it's a fantastic deck building experience of a game. I'm looking forward to Legendary Encounters Matrix because of course I am. Because the Matrix is the greatest franchise of all time next to the Fast and Furious. Those are my real opinions. The last one is actually a final deck building game called Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. I am a huge fan of Cowboy Bebop. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And this is a deck building game where you go to the different planets, doing different missions, collecting bounties, but also you've got to fight the big main boss at the end of it. There's these little minis. It's super thematic. It's a lot of fun. You've got to make sure you've got resources uh, in, in, the, in the different currencies, not only with fuel to get to different places, but money and, of course, attacking power. I think if you love Cowboy Bebop and you love board games, this is one you really should try out. So that's my list of 10 games that have IPs on that I really, really love. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below. I'm sure many people are there thinking, why didn't you say this game? I probably haven't played it because it's got an IP on it. That's why. But I'd love to know what you think below about uh, the games that I've chosen and any games that you think deserve to be on your list. The final question this month is, has a board game theme or story ever emotionally impacted you short answer to that is no i don't think well other than rage when i don't win or anger or joy and fun the general joy and fun of playing games those are emotions i feel uh, but it's not the game's theme or mechanisms it's not the game itself that has emotionally impacted me. I think what the question is asking is, has there ever been a game where the theme or the story of the game has made you feel something? I'm the wrong person to ask, but I really have never had that experience, I don't think. Now, there are certain games that I can understand that have really impactful messages behind them. There's lots of war games, for instance, and I'm sure that if you have people who you know in your life who have fought in those wars, which is very possible, then they, they, those might emotionally impact you in that way. I could see that happening. But also themes like Freedom the Underground Railroad. That's a game that I can understand having an emotional impact on you. Or This War of Mine. The story in that is brutal. So I can see that. But firstly, I never played either of those games. Uh, but secondly, it's not why I play games full stop. 
I don't like sad films. I don't like sad, I love sad music, but I try not to listen to any. I kind of feel like I get emotionally manipulated by media a lot of the time. So I steer clear of anything that's gonna really bum me out, make me feel bad because I feel bad enough and I don't need <laughs> my hobby to make me feel bad as well. And I know that a lot of people get things out of that. It's cathartic to get those emotions out. So I understand that. So I don't seek these things out. And I really find it difficult to think about anyone who could play a board game and get emotionally impacted. I mean, maybe if you have been playing through a campaign game of some description and you get really attached to your character, right? I mean, RPGs, like role-playing games, is hugely emotionally impacting for people. I know people who have played games and when their character has died, it's been devastating. They've gone, they've grieved for that character. I have never seen it being possible in board games, but I wouldn't say it's not possible in board games. But it's also not where I want to go with the board game hobby personally, although I'm happy that it exists for other people. There are games themselves that mean something to me. Games like My City, uh, Wrong and Right, that's not an emotionally impactful game there's a very light story going on but the game itself now means something to me uh, and i'll never get rid of my copy because of i played with paula and we played it on a train from germany to hungary and it was a fantastic experience i've never run across a game that's really even had the capacity to emotionally impact me from its story itself I certainly get all the good feelings of playing games, but often it's the game itself isn't what's making me feel good, it's the community, it's, the, it's playing, it's having fun with friends, that type of thing. Let me know if any game that you've played, maybe there's some glaring obvious game that I just can't think of. Maybe I've tried to get rid of it out of my memory. <laughs> don't know but until next time thank you so much everyone for watching this episode i hope that if you've got any answers to any of the questions that have been asked this week or any rebuttals to any of my answers let me know down below so i can see what you have to say i'd love to see it until next time everyone i'll see you next time bye